Ibn Rushd or Averroes is one of the most famous philosophers of the Middle Ages, but his fame in philosophy was more in Latin translation than in Arabic. Nevertheless, he was a major thinker in the Arabic tradition, and he did have some innovative thinking that uh, came forth from his study of the thought of Al-Farabi and generally the Aristotelian tradition. His approach is quite different from that of Avicenna, as we'll see, in metaphysics and in many other areas as well. We're going to be devoting three days of study to the thought of Ibn Rushd because of the peculiarity of his thought a peculiarity that makes it perhaps particularly relevant to discussions of philosophy and religion. In particular, we're going to be focused on the issue of discourse and meaning with regard to philosophical language. The issue of truth will also come in very importantly as well. So the first, our first day of class is going to be devoted to a general introduction to some of the issues in the thought of Ibn Rushd. And then in the second lecture today, we're going to specifically look at selected materials from his Fussell McCall, a, a treatise sometimes translated as the Decisive Treatise. I have a slightly different translation, which I think reflects more precisely the content and the precise language of the title, but we'll look into that a little bit later. For now, though, I think we, we should begin with a bit of history, because in, in somewhat in contrast with the other thinkers, in the case of Ibn Rushd, we find it's absolutely essential to see the historical context in which he worked and in which his thought came to the forefront. That context was the context of the Almohad Revolution in North Africa and Andalusia. Abu Walid Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Rushd al-Hafid, or Vera was as he was known in Latin Europe, came from a long line of religious jurists a family which valued scholarship and learning very highly. His grandfather, after whom Averroes was named, was a leading judge in Cordoba. The famous grandfather's son, the father of Averroes, was also a judge or caudi in Cordoba, as Averroes himself was later to be. Two, three. I want to look at Averroes and the Almohad Caliphate which I think is a key to understanding Averroes as the unique thinker that he was of his time, and clearly a thinker who had considerable influence, as I've already mentioned, in his works that were translated into Latin. He also had influence in Hebrew as well. But I want to examine the thought of Averroes himself, and that has to be done in historical context. The beginnings of the Almoravid dynasty, which was in power at the time of the birth of Averroes, took place around 1040, and that dynasty continued for nearly a hundred years, finally collapsing in 1147. It collapsed under the pressure of the Almohads. The Almohad dynasty er itself arose thanks to the thought of Ibn Tumart, the thought and the revolutionary efforts of Ibn Tumart uh, against the uh, Almor Almoravid dynasty, uh, Ibn Tumart leading that attack on the Almor Almoravid dynasty. Ibn Tumart was an interesting figure and uh, quite a charismatic theological leader. He was a devout Muslim and he was a follower of the Sunni al-Ghazali. We know that he went from the Berber mountains uh, at the Atlas Mountains to Cordoba to study, and then he took a trip to the Middle East, where some, cl some reports claim that he studied with al-Ghazali, something which would be very difficult historically. It seems that al-Ghazali would have been already deceased by the time that Ibn Tumart arrived in the area. Or perhaps he studied with the students of al-Ghazali and learned a great deal of the thought of uh, theological thought of al-Ghazali. Be that as it may, it's clear that he had theological training in the Middle East and perhaps in Baghdad. We also know that he spent some time in Ismaili Egypt. This also seems to be something quite relevant to his development uh, as a theologian. After his, after his training in theology and his studies, he came back and introduced to the Berber tribes a more devout form of Islamic practice. And he was, in doing so, he was very, very critical of the ways of the Almoravids. Some of the critique is rather ad hominem. He complained at one point that the Almoravids were 
feminizing Islam because the men wore veils and yet the women were unveiled and the women were allowed to speak up in public uh, and the men listened to them. But of course, the reason for that is that the maternal was, uh, the, the tribe, the Almoravids came from a more maternal approach to uh, the dynasty with the prominence of women there. And of course, the the wearing of uh, uh, of a covering over the face most likely was for the sake of uh, deal, just a habitual way of dealing with the sand. At any rate, Ibn Tumart used various arguments to talk about the corruption and the weakness and the moral weakness of the Almoravid dynasty. He used this to rally the Berber, Berbers, tr the Berber tribes around him, but also even with the Berber tribes, he introduced a much more devout form of Islamic practice. And he was helped, of course, a great deal in this, not only uh, from his own fervor and his own charism, but rather, but also by his ability to speak the Berber language. And so he, he, he worked to build uh, connections with the Berbers within the tribes and also within the customary uh, structure of the Berber tribes as well. The structures of the Berber tribes were sometimes set up in circles of importance with a smaller circle closer to the leaders of the tribe. But these ideas, this idea of circles was that everyone was to be included in some fashion in the discussion making in the, in the decision making and in the discussions in some fashion. And Ibn Tumart used this a great deal in his own approach to uniting the tribes. But enough of the historical material on this. Let's pass on uh, a bit further into the actual context of what, uh, what Avera was experienced himself. The leader of the, uh, the founder of the dynasty of the Almohads was a religious follower of Ibn Tumart named Abd al-Mu'min. And he found, after the death of Ibn Tumart, he took control of the, of the rebellion and completed the overthrow of the Almoravids. Ibn Tumart had followers with him who were Berbers and followed him as a, as a kind of law, tribal leader and leader from the Atlas Mountains. Dr. Maribel Fierro has a fascinating theory of the legitimation of the Almohad dynasty through knowledge and education. Fierro is from CSIC, a center for the study of uh, Islam and uh, scientific study of Islam uh, in, as part of the um, Spanish uh, Scientific Center in Madrid. And she was recently visiting my university, Marquette University here in Milwaukee, and she presented a fascinating account of the development of the Almohad revolution. And according to the account that she proposed, the notion of the, the religiosity and uh, the uh, charism and the uh, great strength that Ibn Tumart brought in uniting the Berbers that needed to be replaced in some way when Ibn Tumart died because Ibn Tumart left no one to succeed him. And Abd al-Mu'min succeeded him, but then the question arose, what unique contribution would be made by uh, Abd al-Mu'min and his dynasty to unify the entire empire in some fashion? And the thesis is that there was an enormous effort made through, not, through education and knowledge to build new forms of knowledge and to solidify the empire in that way. So what did the empire offer? It offered a vision and an understanding of the nature of knowledge and education that advanced the entire empire and the entire civilization. As part of this then, Abd al-Mu'min established a religious school at Marrakesh. And at that religious school, Many of the followers of the and important people in the uh, um, in the Almohad dynasty uh, came to study or were required to come to study. We know in 1153, Avera was, was at Marrakesh, which was the center for uh, education in the new empire, 
And Charles Butterworth notes that before this, Averroes had studied law, medicine, theology, and natural sciences. And he further notes that, that it appears that Alver, Averroes may have been called to Marrakesh. That's an interesting issue. I'm not so sure that he was called or whether he went there because that was the center of study and the center for advancement and, and uh, the place to be, to be for one who wanted to become involved in the grand educational project of the new empire. Avera was then began his participation in the Almohad revolution among the intellectual elites or Taliba. The Taliba were these religious circles, or these circles of religious, scientific, and, and educational expertise uh, uh, containing the Almohad intellectual elites. Now, what's interesting in the account of Fierro on this and explaining what, what the political context was is, is the following. In a sense, what the Almohads were doing was not the customary Sunni way of selecting the ulama or the learned in religious studies and religious matters, a selection of them by the community itself. That seems to be the Sunni way. The Sunni way was to recognize within the community those who had the special expertise. But that's not what they did in the context of the uh, Almohad Empire. And earlier, with Ibn Tumart, there was a kind of Mahdiism. Ibn Tumart was called the Mahdi, the leader, the, uh, the great leader who comes back every century uh, and, and appears and leads people to a, to a reformation. And something of the, that Mahdiism uh, is present. And Ibn Tumart made a claim to have a kind of special knowledge. And the revolution was focused on Ibn Tumart and led by him because he had a kind of special guidance. Well, this is the kind of teaching that one finds in Shiism, too, because Shiism makes the claim that, in fact, there is special guidance received from God by the leader of the, of the dynasty. So it appears that, in some sense, Ibn Tumart was following that kind of enthusiasm and that kind of uh, understanding of, of the religious leader as having a kind of special insight provided directly by God that is found, found in Shiism. Uh, so he's following that to some extent, but he's not following the customary Sunni ways of selecting the religious leaders from among the community. Rather, it's, it appears that the Almohads undertook to, to educate and form its own intellectual elites. So a great deal of uh, time and resources were poured into the formation of the intellectual elites called Taliba, or students. And so these were the intellectual elites who were going to lead in the Almohad revolution. Again, the revolution itself and this kind of intellectual leading and the stress on education and knowledge and its development were part of the leg legitimization of the Almohad Empire itself, what unified the empire. So Fierro's thesis is st still requires more work and, and more argumentation, but it's a fascinating thesis that insists upon uh, the notion that the Almohads wanted to have control of knowledge and its development as absolutely key to the formation of their own empire. In 1163, Abd al-Mu'min dies and is succeeded by his son, thereby instituting the hereditary dynasty of the Almohads. That son was Abu Yaqob Yusuf, who reigned and continued the revolution from 1163 to 1184. That is the revolution in knowledge and understanding and, and control of the intellectual elites or rather the development of the intellectual elites in accordance with basic principles that, of, of the value of knowledge uh, that was so important to the establishment of the Almohads. In 1168, so we, al we already know that Averroes was involved 
in some fashion because at 1153 he was at Marrakesh. And it appears that he began working with the, the revolution then, or working with the government at that time. Now, in 1168, Averroes was introduced at the Caliphal court by Ibn Tufail, who was vizier at the time. Ibn Tufail is the author of the no philosophical novel Hai Ibn Yaqdan, a very important novel that tells us a great deal about the, the, the Almohad project and much more as well, and also the importance of reason and rationality and a kind of greater importance that it has than the literal interpretation of scripture. It's well worth studying, and I recommend it most highly. The name of the novel, again, is uh, Hai Ibn Yaqthan, Alive Son of Awake, by Ibn Tufail. Well, when Averroes was introduced at the Caliphal court, introduced to Abu Yaqob Yusuf, Abu Yaqob Yusuf raised the question with him of the eternity of the world. That is, is the world eternal, or is it created? This was a dangerous question as far as Averroes was, was concerned, because Averroes did not have a full understanding of the mind of the Caliph on this matter. If Averroes took one side and it turned out to be not the side of the Caliph, then the result could be deadly. So Averroes demurred, and Ibn Tufail and Abu Yaqob Yusuf began to converse on it. After some time, Averroes, it became clear to Averroes that the Caliph had a great deal of knowledge of philosophy and was open to many diverse ideas, and so Averroes himself joined into the conversation. He impressed the Caliph very deeply, and it appears that at this time the Caliph commissioned commentaries on the works of Aristotle, commentaries that would clarify the, the meaning of the works of Aristotle. And it appears that this is something that continued to be funded for the rest of the the rest of the life of, of Averroes, funded one way or another, either by having Averroes appointed as, as, uh, as Caudi or judge and allowed the time to work on these matters, or for the, in the time that he was the physician of the Caliph as well. But generally, we, we say that at this time, the middle commentaries, paraphrasing works, were commissioned by the Caliph. But it's another indication of the important role that Avera was played in the educational formation uh, and among the educational elites uh, in the Almohad Empire. So all indications are that Avera was became a central figure in the revolution through medical, legal, scientific, philosophical, and even theological works on his part. We know that he was first Qadi or religious judge at Seville, and he became Qadi at Cordoba, twice each for those, those two. We also know that he served as court physician from 1182 and rose high at court, traveling a great deal between Marrakesh and Cordoba. So he's clearly a central figure, very much involved in the intellectual side, in the intellectual development uh, of the Taliban and others in the context of the Almohad Revolution. Averroes wrote commentaries of three sorts on the works of Aristotle, in addition to other treatises. But these major commentaries are divided as follows. First, there are short, and there are short commentaries, which are, for the most part, early commentaries which were epitomizing paraphrases at times often dependent upon translations of Greek materials and other secondary sources. But these were not solely epitomizing paraphrases. They also raised important philosophical questions, and they show that Averroes was quite an astute reader of Aristotle, even at an early age. The second kind of commentaries are the middle commentaries, which were more literal paraphrases of the work of Aristotle, which I just mentioned a few moments ago. And finally, he also wrote long commentaries, which included a complete text of Aristotle and lengthy commentary, often line by line, on the meaning and intent of Aristotle. And as I mentioned, there are other works as well. We'll get into some of the details regarding his works uh, next week and the week, and the week following. Our concentration 
in today's class is going to be on his Fussell McCall, which George Harani renders as, quote, the decisive treatise determining the nature of the connection between religion and philosophy. And Charles Butterworth renders the title as, the book of the decisive treatise determining the connection between law and wisdom. My own preferred title for the book and the translation of the, of the Arabic is this, Book of the Distinction of Discourse and the Establishment of the Relation of Religious Law and Philosophy. I think as we proceed in other discussions uh, later, you'll see why I've chosen that title, uh, to re chosen to render the Arabic in that fashion. I should make note here that the discussion in this lecture and the one to follow is keyed to the work of Charles Butterworth, the translation in Averroes, the book of the decisive treatise, determining the connection between law and wisdom, and the epistle dedicatory, translated by Butterworth, uh, and published in 2001. This work contains a revised Arabic text and an English translation of the Fossil McCall, uh, as well as the Epistle Dedicatory and some other important texts as well. The Arabic text and translation that Butterworth uses here, he says uh, these are, quote, based on Mustin Mahdi's revised version of the Arabic text Kitab Fasl Makal, edited by George Harani. That is, Mahdi's, the text is based on Mahdi's re-examination of the manuscripts. And the result is a somewhat different text, but not radically different. The translation that we've provided with you for free on, on the uh, Toledo site is an older is the older translation by George Harani. But my work here is going to be keyed to that of Butterworth. Uh, yes. Before proceeding, what is the context of this work? Well, Let's consider what was happening around 1178 to 1181. You'll recall now that I said that in 1168, Avera was, was at the court of Abu Yaqub Yusuf, and he received some kind of commission from Abu Yaqub Yusuf. That is, he was endorsed, his work was endorsed in a significant way because of the importance of Aristotle as the philosopher and Aristotle for science. This is really quite an important endorsement. Well, ten years, uh, roughly ten years after that endorsement, Averroes wrote four works in a very short period of time, period from about 1178 to 1181 or perhaps 1182. These were very important works that say a great deal about method and his way of approaching things. The four works are these. First, first an epistle dedicatory on divine knowledge, an epistle that generally uh, travels in the uh, in the company of the Fossil McCall or or so-called decisive treatise. It's an important philosophical analysis of the question of whether God has knowledge of particulars. And the importance of that issue lay in the fact that Al Ghazali had condemned the philosophers on three important points: had condemned the philosophers for the denial of divine knowledge condemn the philosophers for their assertion of the eternity of the world as opposed to its creation ex nihilo, and condemn the philosophers as infidels for the view that there, there is no reward in, or punishment in the afterlife. And we'll get into those in some detail in just a short time. They will be quite relevant, especially the second one, the issue of the eternity of the world or creation. The second work that was produced in this very same time is the Fossil McCall, which we'll be studying carefully soon. All of these works say important things about the nature of method. The third work that's produced in this same period is the Kash Anamanahish al Adila fil Aqaid al Milla, the explanation of the sorts of proofs in the doctrines of religion. This is an extremely important work. And we may have the opportunity to look at parts of this next week. And finally, fourth, there is his famous Tehafid or Tehafid, or Incoherence of the Incoherence, a detailed critique, passage by passage, uh, critique of Al-Ghazali's Incoherence of the Philosophers. 
It's very important to take note of what's happening here then. In all of these works, Averroes is dealing directly with the thought of Al-Ghazali, among others, as we'll see, and in particular in the Tehafut of Tehafut. Al-Ghazali is one of Islam's greatest theologians and was a very important theologian in the thought, uh, playing an important role in the thought of Ibn Tumart. So it's in this period that Averroes apparently confronts, one might say confronts, the challenge of Al-Ghazali in detail and responds in his own way. And perhaps he is responding in a way that is, that is really in behalf of the Almohad Empire and its educational plan or revolution, the Almohad Revolution of the time. Also, before proceeding, let me make clear just why, in a course on creation in Aquinas and the Arabic philosophical tradition, I'm not proceeding directly to the metaphysical texts of Averroes on creation. Thus far, we focused on metaphysical texts and metaphysical argumentation. But here I'm doing something different, and I think it's absolutely essential for understanding what Averroes is doing and the importance of his thought in the matter of creation. The concerns, we, the, the concerns to be dealt with here are concerns of method. First of all, it appears that Averroes is following very closely the guidance of Aristotle in Aristotle's Prior Analytics, Book 1, Chapter 32. That is the notion that all discourse should be subject to the philosophical analysis of its truth content. In this context, then, philosophy has a certain important priority to scriptural teachings. Secondly, this method also has to deal with action, and demonstration will help guide right human action, and demonstration controls then in this way, may come to control then this way, the interpretation of religious scriptures. These are very important points with regard to method in the verse, and we're going to see them in action in the, in the next video. For now, I pause and uh, I'll end this first introductory video, and uh, then we'll continue into a detailed discussion of the decisive treatise, or Fossil McCall. So we'll take a break right now.